Emmett Price on the MIC All doing right. what I do. Oh. <laughs> what that, okay, okay. <laughs> I thought you was gonna rap now. I, I got some. Right. I, got, I can spit okay. some bars I'll for say, you. Now. I'll say twelve, eleven, ten, nine, eight, <laughs> seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. I'm Reverend Emmett Price. And I'm Reverend Irene Monroe. And this is the All Revved Up Podcast. During this election season that we're in, there has been a lot of God talk or what I call God speak. Uh, politicians and, and, and by extension, people invoking God within politics. I mean, what are, what are we supposed to do? Yeah, I know. It's very, you know, and you know, the interesting thing is, is that God is on no one's side. Well, that's the okay? point. God is a neutral player. So it becomes quite interesting how that becomes a kind of litmus test for electability, mm. actually on both sides of, of the political aisle. It's interesting because in this nation, and it's a great nation, don't get me wrong, but our money has, you know, God on it. Our guiding documents have God in him. Um, we reference God, you know, in God we trust, you know, one nation under God, indivisible. And so how how do we get to a place where our politics will be about what people think and what people feel and what people desire versus God told me to do this and God told me to say this. And then the problem becomes, what if you're a person of no faith? Mm. Whose God are you talking about, number one? And I think what happens is is that when you have this kind of Christian hegemony here, um, you you create this notion that insider and outsider, because God forbid... Okay. <laughs> there you go. And there you go. God <laughs> forbid if you are not a Christian and then a particular type of Christian. So, yeah, you know, the, our founding fa- fathers said it was fine to worship, but it was the whole idea that you had, you know, freedom of religion, you know? Well, let's press into this because this idea, um, you know, whether you're talking about John Locke or the great, you know, Baptist a clergy person in this nation, Roger Williams, yeah. or even Thomas Jefferson, you know, referencing the First Amendment— there was always this sense that religion is a personal matter and not for public debate or or public, you know, or political or, aggrand- yeah. aggrandizement or for political votes here. But you know, we got to realize this here that that it's always been an incendiary topic, you know, throughout the American sort of narrative around when we look at the religious landscape. I think what we see here that I I thought was very interesting when we talk about evangelicals and we 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 got to make a distinction. You've Come helped on me. Now. I'm okay, looking, you know, I'm looking me at you. As I look at I'm you. looking at you. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, I, so let me ask you this: Would it be would it be fair? Because I know how you feel about this to say Trump evangelicals as opposed to white evangelicals. Because I do understand they're not a monolithic group, although they get lumped in here. But they are. But but we got to say this here: Before Trump, there were this particular. How about this demographic group? Come on now. Of white evangelicals who always always have used politics yeah. in terms of, you know, stocking the Supreme Court, yeah. going after these social issues like abortion, LGBTQ rights. Mm-hmm. So help me with this. Well, I think you, and, and first of all, thank you very much. Cause you <laughs> Not artic- to offend you, your you religious are, You articulated this wonderful, and, and, thank and you. Uh, evangelicalism or evangelicalism is a movement and not a denomination. And so there are many folks uh, who, who are part of the movement who are, who are not white too, right? That's right. And, and who do not um, vow their uh, allegiance to uh, Trump. Um, but, but what you said was so profound because I can remember back in the late 80s and 90s, I'm just dating myself to a time place where I remember where if you were Christian in certain churches, mm-hmm. you were taught that the Republican Party was the Christian party. <laughs> now, clearly not in my church. And not I, in mine either. Uh, right? Okay, But really? there were some churches that were um, that were not black per se, if I can right. say that, where it was taught and trained and indoctrinated. And I think those teachings continue now that if you believe in Christianity, particularly an evangelical stream strand of, you know, of, strand yeah. of uh, uh, yeah. Christianity, then the Republican Party is your party. Yeah. Well, disclosure, I was once an evangelical. Mm. I have never been. I have never been a Republican. And I very much felt very um, passionate about spreading the good news. 
news until I really had to question, you know, who who was I doing this for? for yeah. Ab- absolutely. But I, I just think that when we look at white evangelicals, I think that we have to look at them within the context of political movements in our in our country here. Mm-hmm. So let's just look at it in terms of when when I look at at, 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 at black folks in particular, I mean we you know, we were Republicans because it was the party That's of right. of Lincoln. That's right. You know, it was part of the reconstruction effort that never actually took place. Right. But then if, if you remember, well, I don't remember, but we, we and I know you think I'm I, about to look. OK, I know, <laughs> see, take, I know you think I'm that old. Take me way back. OK, <laughs> but I am going to take you way back here. But but the thing is, is that when we see the first exodus really of black Republicans mm-hmm. moving over to the Democratic Party, that's FDR and the new, that's the Depression, FDR mm-hmm. and the New Deal. Mm-hmm. The second wave, though, is the civil rights movement mm-hmm. because we got LBJ in office. Mm-hmm. So we got these, this is being passed here. You got the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Mm-hmm. We got the Voting Act. In but all, yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. in 65. But what we also have is Barry Goldwater, Mm. Senator Barry Goldwater from Arizona. Mm -hmm. And his whole thing was that he was against the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. He used dog whistles Mm -hmm. and a a racist agenda because it was part of the Southern strategy that I think is still operating today. We saw its manifestation with Nixon and and very much during the Reagan era. And so the whole idea with the Southern strategy was to whitify Mm. really the electorate by any any means necessary. So I, I, I th- we see that, you know, we see that now today. I, I don't think it's ever la- left. Well, isn't it ironic that the old Democrats who were also known as the Dixie Dixiecrats, Crats, that's right, right are, are now the Republicans per se. And the old Republicans, uh, particularly those who were called the radical Republicans who were actually fighting against segregation, Hi. are now the Democrats. That's right. I mean, interesting flip flop. Um, But it's also interesting to think, too, that politicians make assumptions that that black people, particularly amongst people of color, but black people particularly are universally Democrat. Yeah, I know. But you know what? We are a majority, I think, of Democrats. You know, I I remember what my high school, (laughs) Tilton High School buddy, Al Sharpton, said at the, I think it was a 2004 Democratic convention. He says this year, he says, you know, yeah, we were once Republican, you know, because Frederick Douglass was also Republican. That's right. But it was the whole idea of this year. Once we didn't get that 40 acres and and a mule, mule. it was the whole idea that then we were going to take this donkey as far as we could take it <laughs> and stuff and 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 it was it really became the party around civil rights and 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 LBJ had a lot to do with that mm-hmm. in terms of passing civil rights you know legislation i think today you know if you're a black Repu- Pu- republican i think it's harder to come out as a black republican than it is to come out as black and queer <laughs> and i'm speaking <laughs> as a black and queer person <laughs> How about that? I think a black Republican has to be closeted in today's political climate. Oh, my goodness. One thing about the black church, if I can, is the importance and the valuable stake that the pastor has. Because in many black churches, the pastor is almost like the lead politician. And in certain cities, in certain regions, and particularly certain small towns or whatnot, often black pastors are um, elected officials. Yeah. And yeah. so is that part of this move to, in many ways, move black people to a specific designated party? I mean, how do we look at this? I don't know. See, so this is how I think about it. I, I think number one is that I, I'm, I'm very glad we have the Johnson Amendment. That, I think that came, yeah, that did come out in 1954. It was the whole idea that no church, particularly where tax exempt, mm-hmm. as you know, mm-hmm. is to endorse any political candidate. Mm-hmm. And of course, Trump is trying to get, get you know, do away with it. But I think that when we look at the black church, and you've helped me so much with this, Emmett, we are not a monolith. That's right. Okay. That's right. So I think that we have some political churches, mm-hmm. and I think that we have some churches that that have very politically active Christians. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so for instance, the politically active Christians, I think of MLK mm-hmm. and the uh, Southern Christian. What is the conference? Southern Christian Christians Leadership Conference. Conference. Mm-hmm. I think of them um, certainly. I think of when I think of a, a politically 
you, you know, a political church, then I, in many ways I have to think of, of a white evangelical church. Okay. Because a lot of our churches, even if we're otherworldly or thisworldly, mm-hmm. and otherworldly many times they really will sort of retreat from from any kind of political sort of, you know, engagement. Yeah. And they won't have political candidates that come and try to pimp our vote. Come on Okay, now. here, that, that Sunday before oh, Tuesday this, election. You about to get me riled up because you know I cannot stand when the circus comes to church, <laughs> right? You, 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 you have the folks with their advanced people, That's right. you know, who show up to make sure that they have a pew in the front of the church and then ain't service... never seen them. The, n- n- be- never, never seen, seen them before. Right. Service begins right. and then all of a sudden there's a disruption. The ushers in the back you know, are frantic because folks are walking during the prayer. Now everybody right. knows you don't <laughs> walk during the prayer in the black church. But, but you <laughs> have this movement that happens and then they get up, the pastor invites them to speak and and then as soon as they're done, what do they do, Irene? Mm-hmm. They leave. Mm-hmm. They sure do. Don't even stay for the service. Oh, my goodness. Wait, wait. And then don't even leave a token. <laughs> but see, I, I, guess, wouldn't even, I wouldn't okay, even go in there. But I guess we're the token. But, right? Ooh. Oh. <laughs> I guess we're the token here. I am so for politicians being invited to a fellowship or reception after the service or before the service. But don't interrupt the people's worship, please. Yeah. Well, you know what I find very interesting here? Now, I want them in the church. I ver- very much do. And I, and I really feel like, given the fact that the black church is a multiple site, it has always had to serve many functions mm-hmm. for us. So I like them during the service. What I don't like is just what you just, you know, espouse. They don't stay. Yeah. So it's very clear what they want. I, it troubles me that the pastor then, as using, you, you know, your reference that he's the lead politician does not massage this white politician because it's usually mm. it usually is the white one because black folks even yeah. if they're running for they know they the know they know the stay. okay now yeah. they got some yeah. home training yep. true 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 you're listening to the all revved up podcast we will be right back All right, that break was so needed because <laughs> I, I felt like you called us tokens, and I'm I'm not sure what to do with that. Well, but, I, th- I but, but but the truth is, we are we are when you don't educate a, a, a really ripe congregation okay. about the political process, and that we only see you at that moment. Okay. Okay, and then you do a Casper number on us. Okay. All okay, right. a little All right. ghosting up in All here. Right. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> well, you have this phrase that has me thinking and your phrase is blind obedience that's versus right. reasoned, reasoned faith. faith that's right talk talk to us well, about well you that. know a little bit about that has everything to do with with this here that that blind obedience is is something very simple like okay i do it because my pastor tells me to do it okay. i do it because the bible tells me to do it but the point about it is that and and so when you see folks that that hit that very literalist kind of interpretation of, of religion, mm-hmm. they don't realize that they're discriminating even against themselves, themselves. Okay. even though they're, co- they're going to discriminate discriminate against women and LGBT people or yeah. people who take a certain, ex, you know, take a certain kind of position. But, but, but reason faith says that I look at the world. So you got to look at, you got to think of whether this Bible is a living Bible. Okay. And, and you're looking at faith in light of, of a, you're looking at the world in light of a faith that wants to do justice, to be more inclusive, that understands that here, when that Bible was written, you know, thousands of years ago, mm-hmm. we're living in this mm-hmm. era today here. So it's a difference between me, my, I. That's right. And, and we and us. That's right. Right. So, That's right. so if somebody. Or just us. Or just, there okay, you go. Just, just us. us. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, so blind obedience sometimes is not just based on religion, but kind of a, a, a ethos or a thought or even, even, you know, my favorite word is zeitgeist. That's right. right. A, a moving idea that sweeps through the land. So there's a particular woman who we've heard talk about her allegiance to President Donald Trump. And she's a black straight woman from here, Quincy, Massachusetts. And this is her at a recent uh, Trump rally up in New Hampshire. Her name is Annie St. Hilaire. All right, let's hear what sister has to say. Not a lot of African-Americans feel as if he 
relates to them just because of the fact that the media tries to twist and manipulate his words so much. I just don't see how a president who the black vote didn't put into office could care so much about African Americans and could get the unemployment rate so low. I just don't see how he could be a racist. Irene, I'm so confused, but but I I will I will say this I will say this if I had not started this morning on my knees in prayer, mm-hmm. I would be someplace else right now mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I don't know how we defend as a black person Trump not being racist and blaming that on leftist media. You know, it's very, very interesting listening to to uh, this young woman speak. You can't have anything but cognitive dissonance. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, is that this is a woman who's really informed by soundbites. Ah. This is a classic example of, okay, blind obedience okay. Okay. versus a reasoned kind of faith yeah. or a critical sort of analysis here. You know, it's very, very interesting here for me that, you know, when I think Think about, you know, uh, blacks who vote for for Trump. He, he does. He has a brilliant strategy. I mean, he is out there trying to get black voters. Oh, when he first started his presidential run, he said, well, you know, as black people, you, you have should nothing vo- to lose. You right? have nothing to lose. Yeah. And so he has basically two strategies. He can discourage you from coming out. Mm. He did that with Elijah Cummings, Cummings yeah. because what he did was and also with our four congressional women, because when you say go back to your infested and, mm. and roach, you know, infested area mm. and then you show pictures. What he does is he discourages certain blacks who do who still live in those communities who have had these politicians who may feel, but they don't do anything. Mm-hmm. But they're not going to vote for Trump, but they won't come out. Mm-hmm. But then what he figures he does, then he flips the corn and he does something where he used token moments to show that he's addressing our issues. An obvious example here is Kim Kardashian with, uh, what is the woman's name here? Was Alice Marie Johnson. This is a woman who played, what, not played, who spent 21 years incarcerated mm-hmm. for some sort of, uh, she was a nonviolent first time offense. Mm-hmm. But the point was, then he's addressing our one of our big issues, which is mass incarceration. Yeah. And he uses that as an example. So when you see that and you run that loop, OK, uh, on certain networks, mm-hmm. you're saying, you know what? He's in our camp. I mean, that's that's amazing because here you have a, a, a black straight woman who is so deep into the camp that she would articulate Essentially, the sound bites, right? The, the camp sound bites that that disavow the other sound bites from the <laughs> opposing camp, and so it is clearly a sense of a blind obedience. And, and based on what you said, that even go against her own, own, right? You know, her her voting. You know, yeah, participating in her own oppression. Yeah. Okay, in many ways, but you know what? As being a, a person in the LGBT community. We have gay Republicans that just recently come out for Trump. So mm-hmm. you would understand, well, well, what is that about? Well, that's about money and power. Mm-hmm. These are the sort of the white gay males who have, in many ways, we've been fighting within our own LGBT community because, see, one of the things that they feel bereft of is 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 just heteronormativity privilege mm-hmm. because everything else works for them, their money, their schools, or whatever. So you begin to see, like we see sort of like with the with the church uh, you know you know Trump is not good for the nation but he's not good also for the church mm-hmm. now it's very very interesting because we thought white evangelical christians would change Trump, mm-hmm. but Trump has, has changed them. Has changed yeah. them, yeah. and so they remind me they have sort of struck a deal with the devil. It sort of reminds me of Matthew sixteen. Come on, you can help me. What is it? it what is it to gain the world and, <laughs> and lose, lose your soul? Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking about Robert Johnson, right? What, what is it to want to be the greatest blues player? There you go. Right? And then go to the crossroads and yeah. make a deal with the devil. That's right. But 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 help me to understand this, and I, I think we're at a good status quo here. Help me to understand this as clergy, as faith leaders, how do we lead people um, on the journey of faith Mm -hmm. where it doesn't have to be politicized based on whether you're, uh, and I like to say an Autobot or Decepticon, (laughs) right? You know, how, how, how do you take your journey of faith 
which leads us back to what was intended for this great nation to have a separation between the church and, and the state. And, and also, but at the same time, I, I, I feel like raise the moral moral compass and high ground because I think a classic example I have to go back really to the civil rights movement because what what we saw in that moment that historical moment is where you move people from the pulpit to the picket line mm-hmm. and to me this is where you have politically active Christians mm-hmm. as opposed to a political church. It's it, it's a movement yeah. that, and I think, I, I really have to say this, this is one of these times that I have to say, because I'm always critical of the black church, but this is when you see the black church at its best, because we have different strands of theology. Come on, we got the prosperity gospel, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. the bling bling, mm-hmm. okay? But we got the social gospel that certainly is this connection between social equality, you know, and salvation and you see that with King he was an example of that and now I would say with with Reverend Barber and his and his yeah. moral Mondays yeah. and then we got the sort of black liberation theology I kind of fall in that camp you got to tell me what camp <laughs> but that's the where the fight for black liberation is a divine mis- mission and you see that with Nat Turner uh David Walker but some present folks like Jer- Jeremiah Wright can I say that yeah. that got yeah. him in trouble yeah. so I think that you can have that you can be as they say fired up and ready ready to go with your faith to move the compass that will include a much more participatory, you know, government and a much more multicultural society. And I think that that those strands of our black theologies are just really classic examples of that. I mean, what do you think about that? Well, one of my favorite songs that we sang growing up in church was I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I <laughs> promise him that I would serve him till I die. And in serving the Lord, we also serve all of God's children, which means all people. And so we have to move away from the me, my, I centric space yeah. to to the we's and the us's and right. to see us, as you mentioned before, as a holistic community of human beings. Yeah. Can we learn to love one another? Can we learn to, to, to want the best for one another, to encourage one another, to inspire one another, and to challenge one another to be better? And so that's what I'm looking at. That's what I'm hoping for. That's what I'm working towards. And, you know, all I can say is Irene I hope you have a closing word for us today because I am (laughs) revved up all right all right we have never been where we are today as a nation from natural disasters to terrorist attacks hate crimes and unmentionable acts of violence while division abounds among us may we be bold and courageous enough to chart a better future for ourselves and the nation Let us pray for the leaders of this country to come together to provide strategic leadership that will lead to peaceful living. We pray for our leaders to make decisions that will lead toward the dignity and sanctity of all human life and leadership that guides us in ways that promote peace over war, tolerance over intolerance, reason over blind passion and love over hate. May we never become walls that separate, that hold some in and others out. May we work to being a nation that welcomes all, that nurtures one another, that works for peace and justice, and that cares for the earth. Let us go forth now and do that which calls us to be a nation, this world and ourselves to be more loving, more compassionate, and more united. Ashe. Ashe. And amen. Amen. All Revved Up is a production of WGBH. Our producer is Tori Bedford. Our marketing and social producer is Kambante Smalls. This episode's recording engineer is Doug Sugards. Music for this episode is from Lee Rosevere. Additional thanks to Nina Porzuki, Kate Ida, John Ryan, Phil Rado, Chelsea Mers, Meredith Nierman, and Zach Waldman. If you like what you hear, let us know. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode of All Revved Up. Okay, an obvious example here is Kim Kardashian. No, nope. <laughs> Kim <laughs> Okay, an obvious car dash. Okay. E-E-N. E-E-N. 
Okay, E-N. Okay. Irene, you might have problems with Kim Kardashian. <laughs> <laughs> Kim Kardashian. Everybody says it except for me, Kim Kardashian. But I, you know. Kim Kardashian, right? Kim Kardashian. Is that how you say her name? <laughs> Kim K- Kardashian. K- okay, Kim Kardashian. Okay, so an... Kardashian. Okay, so an obvious example here. Okay, an obvious example here is Kim Kardashian. <laughs> Kardashian. It's her name. Okay, so an <laughs> Kardashian. I got it now. Okay, I got it. An obvious example here is Kim Kardashian. <laughs> We're, obvious... okay. We're done. We're done. Okay, we done. All right, good. Kim Kardashian.